Catholic Commentary on Today's Liturgical Gospel Reading, Luke 4, verses 14 to 30. In the power of the Spirit, Jesus travels back north from Judea to Galilee. He begins his public ministry by teaching in the Jewish synagogues. He quickly draws attention, and news of his activity goes out throughout the whole region. Jesus returns to Nazareth, and according to his custom, goes into the synagogue on the Sabbath. Luke places this visit right at the beginning of his account of Jesus' public ministry. Compare Matthew 13, verses 54 to 58. Mark 6, verses 1 to 6. Because Jesus' proclamation in the synagogue sets the program for the rest of his ministry. In the town where he had grown up, and the synagogue where he had studied. Scripture. Jesus now stands up during the service to read from the scriptures. Luke captures the drama of the moment, lingering over each of Jesus' actions. After he stood up, Jesus was handed a scroll, then unrolled the scroll. After the reading, these three actions will be reversed. The effect is to highlight the reading, which stands in the center. The scroll is of the prophet Isaiah, and Jesus finds the passage that explains his mission. John the Baptist's mission was similarly explained using Isaiah. Applying the first-person text to himself, Jesus confirms with his own words what earlier events had revealed about his identity. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. At his baptism, the Spirit had indeed descended upon him. Jesus, the Spirit-filled Messiah, is thus like David. See 132.69. 2.4. Samuel, with the horn of oil in hand, anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David. The rest of the Isaiah passage regards Jesus' mission, which involves both words and deeds. Regarding his words, Jesus has been sent in order to bring glad tidings, verb euangelizo, and to proclaim, verb cariso, in Luke 4, verse 18 and 19, sometimes translated preach. At the end of the chapter, as Jesus goes around preaching, he will repeat that he has been sent to proclaim the good news for 43 to 44, c. 722, 8121. These key verbs are related to the nouns gospel, euangelion, and gospel proclamation, kerygma. The book of Isaiah is thus fittingly called the Old Testament gospel because of its proclamation of good news. The privileged recipients of Jesus' proclamation will be the poor. These are the Tanawim, who are materially poor and humbly look to God, and now to Jesus, to provide what they need. However, Jesus will also reach out to those who are spiritually poor, but perhaps materially wealthy, tax collectors and sinners. The content of Jesus' preaching is his proclamation of liberty, Ephesus. This phrase from the Isaiah passage points back to an important verse in Leviticus. You shall proclaim liberty in the land for all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. During a jubilee year, see the sidebar, jubilee year, those in debt slavery were set free. Thus, what Jesus is announcing in Nazareth is the definitive time of jubilee. His ministry will be one of granting liberty to those in debt on account of their sins. Indeed, Jesus will especially set people free through the forgiveness, same word, Ephesus, of their sins. Moreover, regarding Jesus' deeds, Jesus will set people free by physical healings, for example, Peter's mother-in-law. Powerful miracles will bring liberty to the captives, for instance, the woman who is set free by Jesus from her bondage to Satan. Jesus will thus bring about Israel's restoration from its true exile, in fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecies. Loose the bonds from your neck, captive daughter Zion. Other healing miracles will include giving sight to the blind. The next phrase is inserted from another chapter of Isaiah, to let the oppressed go free. It is better rendered to set at liberty those who are oppressed, so as to show the repetition of the word liberty, aphesis. This is an example of what the rabbis would later call the rule of Gezerah Shawa, by which two similar texts linked by a common word could be used to interpret one another. The word liberty, Ephesus, links the two passages Isa 61, 1 and 58, 6, as found in the Septuagint of Isaiah. The Hebrew text of Isaiah has two different words, but nonetheless, the two passages may have been associated with one another because of common themes. The end of the reading goes back to Isaiah 61 and again refers to the Jubilee, the year acceptable to the Lord. After the reading, the three actions before the reading are reversed. Rolling up the scroll, he handed it back to the attendant and sat down. By sitting, Jesus prepares to teach the people, and they in turn fix their eyes on him as they await his words. Earlier, the elderly Simeon understood that his eyes had seen God's salvation. Will the people of Nazareth likewise understand? Jesus makes a bombshell announcement. Today this scripture passage is fulfilled in your hearing. With Jesus, the time of waiting for the fulfillment of God's promises in the scriptures is over. The messianic jubilee announced by Isaiah is at hand. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Here and later in his ministry, Jesus will emphasize that God's blessings are available today. Moreover, the fulfillment takes place literally in their ears. The people should thus consider themselves blessed for seeing Jesus with their eyes and hearing him with their ears. However, Jesus will twice warn that those with ears to hear ought to hear. Will the people of Nazareth take heed? 
Initially they do, all spoke highly of him. The verb martyro here meaning, bear witness, testify, is used frequently in Acts when referring to individuals who are well spoken of by the people. The people are amazed at the gracious words of Jesus, witnessing to the power of his preached word. However, the people are also perplexed. Isn't this the son of Joseph? This is what was thought, though the reader knows quite well that Jesus is the son of God. Despite the Davidic lineage of people in Nazareth, perhaps Jesus' origins were simply too humble for him to be considered the Messiah. The parallel passages say that they took offense at him. Only Luke, the physician, records Jesus' proverb, Physician, cure yourself. Jesus interprets the people's reaction as a demand for a sign from him, like those that were done in Capernaum. Unlike Matthew and Mark, Luke has not yet specifically recounted the things Jesus did in Capernaum, although Jesus has already been active in many towns of Galilee. 14. 15. Luke recounts this Nazareth scene first, because it provides the key for understanding the events of Jesus' ministry. Jesus continues with the first of his six Amen sayings in Luke. Beginning a sentence with this Hebrew word emphasizes the truth of the statement that follows. Jesus gives a general principle that no prophet is accepted, or acceptable, in his hometown, implying that he is himself a prophet. Jesus has just proclaimed the Jubilee, the year acceptable, for 19 to the Lord, but now he is the one not acceptable. This occurs in his own native place, precisely where the law said that one returns during a Jubilee. With this ironic play on words, Jesus is about to issue his Jewish listeners a prophetic challenge regarding the scope of the Jubilee, calling on two Old Testament prophets as supporting witnesses, see Deut 19. 15. Jesus the prophet explains that the blessings of the Messianic Jubilee apply not only to Israel, but also to the Gentiles. First, Elijah worked a miracle for a Gentile widow in Zarephath in the land of Sidon, enabling her and her son to survive a famine. Second, Elisha worked a miracle for the Gentile Naaman the Syrian, who was cleansed of his leprosy. These two Gentiles, a woman and a man in typically Lucan fashion, even end up acknowledging the God of Israel, 1 Kings 17 verse 24, 2 Kings 5 verse 15, foreshadowing how in Jesus the Gentiles will be led to worship the one true God. Indeed, at the end of the Gospel, Jesus will commission his disciples to extend the Jubilee proclamation of forgiveness, Ephesus, to all the nations. Jesus' comparison with Elijah and Elisha also sets the stage for understanding his later deeds in light of these two Old Testament prophets. Thus, Jesus fulfills not only prophetic texts such as Isaiah 61, but also prophetic types such as Elijah and Elisha. Jesus' scriptural argument for inclusion of the Gentiles filled his listeners with fury, since it challenged their understanding of Israel's status as God's chosen people. Certainly, various Old Testament texts promised that the Gentiles would be included in God's plan of salvation, e.g. Isa 2, 2-4 and even that Israel's restoration would occur with the help of Gentiles. However, the experience of oppression by Gentiles, such as the Romans, led many to expect that the Gentiles would not be saved, but rather would be crushed in the coming day of vindication of God, a phrase Jesus did not include in his reading. Perhaps considering Jesus to be a false prophet who must die, the people sought to hurl him down headlong from the brow of the hill. Though Jesus' public ministry has just begun, his death is already foreshadowed. Simeon had indeed predicted that Jesus would be a sign that will be contradicted. The power of evil stands behind such opposition. The devil had told Jesus, throw yourself down, and now the people try to do just that to him. Since Jesus the prophet can only die in Jerusalem, he escapes this attempt on his life. He passed through the midst of them and went away, apparently never to return to Nazareth. In summary, Jesus' Nazareth discourse is indeed a mission statement that sets the program of his ministry of preaching and healing. It presents the gospel in miniature. Jesus the Messiah fulfills scripture, preaches good news to the poor, gives sight to the blind, proclaims liberty to usher in the Jubilee, restores Israel's captives, reaches out to the Gentiles, and finally experiences rejection but escapes, thus foreshadowing his death and resurrection. Reflection and Application Proclaiming Liberty St. John Paul II led the Church in celebrating the Great Jubilee of the year 2000. Pope Francis called an extraordinary Jubilee of Mercy for 2016. The Church's celebration of Jubilee years reminds us that the Jubilee proclaimed by Jesus is ongoing. Jesus is still bringing liberty to captives and forgiveness of sins to those who repent and believe in him. From the Gospel of Luke Catholic Commentary Here's today's actual Gospel reading below. Jesus proclaims the Jubilee in Nazareth. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news of him spread throughout the whole region. He taught in their synagogues and was praised by all. He came to Nazareth, where he had grown up, and went according to his custom into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He stood up to read, and was handed a scroll of the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and found the passage where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring glad tidings to the poor. 
He has sent me to proclaim liberty to captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim a year acceptable to the Lord. Rolling up the scroll, he handed it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all in the synagogue looked intently at him. He said to them, Today this scripture passage is fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke highly of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They also asked, Isn't this the son of Joseph? He said to them, Surely you will quote me this proverb, Physician, cure yourself, and say, Do here in your native place the things that we heard were done in Capernaum. And he said, Amen, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own native place. Indeed, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the sky was closed for three and a half years, and a severe famine spread over the entire land. It was to none of these that Elijah was sent, but only to a widow in Zarephath in the land of Sidon. Again, there were many lepers in Israel during the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When the people in the synagogue heard this, they were all filled with fury. They rose up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town had been built, to hurl him down headlong. But he passed through the midst of them and went away. Biblical Background Jubilee Year In the Exodus, God freed the people of Israel from slavery in Egypt and gave them the promised land, so that Israelites might continue living in this freedom. The Torah provided a way for those who sold their ancestral land and were reduced to slavery because of debts to regain their property and liberty. The fiftieth year, following seven weeks of years, was this year of Jubilee. You shall proclaim liberty in the land for all its inhabitants. It shall be a Jubilee for you when each of you shall return to your own property, each of you to your own family. An indentured Israelite could also be liberated by being redeemed by a kinsman. There was in addition a year of remission of debts for the poor every seven years. In the second part of Isaiah, the Jubilee concept is applied to the people as a whole to describe the return of Israel's exiles to the land. The Lord God is portrayed as Israel's kinsman redeemer who frees Israel from the slavery caused by debts, that is, the exile caused by sins. It is also applied to individuals. The Jubilee is a time for releasing those bound unjustly and setting free the oppressed. Moreover, Isaiah interprets the Jubilee in connection with the Messiah. The Lord's anointed is the one who will proclaim liberty and announce a year of favor from the Lord. The Jubilee law thus becomes a prophecy for Israel's future restoration. The Messiah will come as the kinsman who redeems the enslaved people, ushering in a Jubilee age of liberty. For example, a document found at Qumran combines the Jubilee and the year of remission, interpreting debt spiritually in terms of sins. A priest king Melchizedek will come to proclaim liberty and to free them from all their iniquities. This background helps to understand how Luke presents Jesus in his reading of Isaiah in Nazareth as the fulfillment of these expectations of a Messiah Redeemer who proclaims the Jubilee. Lord, I love your commands. You shall not kill. Simon Dewey, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has sent me to bring glad tidings to the poor. Our Alleluia, Alleluia. 